Oh, hello. I'm award-winning science educator and Walmart Jason Momoa, Kyle Hill. You know, it's not easy keeping a world-class artificial intelligence like Ari here up and running, especially when you're banned from most of the world's universities for unspecified reasons. That's why, thankfully, today's episode is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community centered around thousands of classes and courses that inspire creativity and creation. I just finished Demystifying Artificial Intelligence, Understanding Machine Learning by Christian Hellman, Senior Developer at Microsoft, and they gave me the fundamental knowledge to ensure that ARIA will be supercomputing and cubitin' for years to come. If you want to try Skillshare like I did, the first thousand of you nerds to go into the description below get to try Skillshare Premium for free on me, and after that, it's just about 10 bucks a month. You're welcome. Now on to today's episode. Don't ask about the university thing. Episode time. One day in 1907, Albert Einstein had an interesting thought, as he often did. If we could send messages faster than light, then theoretically we could telegram the past, he thought. But how would something like this be possible? Could we ever create an anti-telephone? Oh, yeah, no, they're called Minkowski diagrams. Yeah, no problem. Bye. That guy sounded a lot like me. Hmm. Now entering the facility. One of the most beautiful things about math and science as a whole to me is their ability to take something as infinitely complicated as the universe and simplify it down so that even a hairless ape on a galactic backwater can somewhat understand it. One of the most powerful examples of this simplification is the diagram. Wait, what are those called? Yeah, hey, what are those diagrams called again? Right, thanks. One of the most powerful examples of this simplification process is the so-called Minkowski diagram. This is a space-time diagram that looks very simple, but if you put yourself at the origin of a graph, make the x-axis space, the y-axis time, and give everything a speed limit according to the speed of light, and these few lines describe everywhere you could possibly go in this universe, past, present, and future. Pretty powerful, right? Well, it was these diagrams that Einstein was thinking about when he was theorizing, messaging the past. But to see where Einstein really got this idea in full, we should delve a little bit more into our diagrams. Oh, all right, just let that go to voicemail. It's probably some weirdo in pants that aren't as casual. I like comfort. Like we said, a so-called Minkowski diagram can very simply show all of space and time. It's in three dimensions and not four, because one spatial dimension is suppressed to include time, and I can't even show you what something in four dimensions looks like. But you can imagine how you can go forward and back, up and down, left and right in space, while time moves forward or up in this diagram. The speed of light is usually put on these diagrams at a 45 degree angle for simplicity's sake, and it represents distances that are untraversable in a certain amount of time. Rotate this boundary in three dimensions, and you get what physicists call a light cone, the region of space-time that contains everything that could be causally connected for an observer because information is also bound by the speed of light. Because the speed of light is the fastest anything travels, everything, every event, occurrence, or phenomenon outside of your light cone is impossibly inaccessible to you. Even if you really, really wanted to go to Gleemax's party tomorrow night orbiting the fifth planet Elf Centauri, sorry buddy, you're not going. It's elsewhere. I'll tell them that you wanted to go though, and that you were bringing spinach dip, which they love out there. Still with me? Cool, attendance is mandatory. Now imagine what it would look like in a diagram like this for me to make a phone call. Say I want to call one of my Kevins who is some distance away from me in space and time. I make the phone call, and some finite it they're not picking up. I hope they don't think I'm some kind of weirdo. Anyway, I, I make the call, theoretically, and some finite amount of time later, they pick up the phone or not. In space-time speak, we would say that me calling Kevin causes Kevin to pick up the phone or not. The two events are causally linked in this way, and this makes some intuitive sense to us. Things start to get weird, though, when events aren't so causally linked. You better call me back, too, as we're going through this. You can't just millennial ghost me. I saw the red text receipt. You're not fooling anyone. The core insight of Einstein's theories of special and general relativity was that 
no matter the observer, no matter how they are moving, if they are moving with a constant velocity, accelerating or standing still, the speed of light must be measured as equal for all of them in all possible reference frames. Aria, you can remove the mustache now. Uh -huh. I like your funny words, mustache man. To accommodate what would become this fact, Einstein theorized that if you move at or near the speed of light, space-time, the fabric of space and time, must warp itself around you. If it didn't, different observers moving differently would start disagreeing about how fast light traveled and therefore about causality itself. This space-time warping embedded in our diagrams we've been going through is the direct cause of some weird physics-y results that you may be already familiar with, from time dilation to me when I'm getting out of a pool. And it's these effects and this space-time that Einstein was thinking about when he imagined an anti-telephone. Oh, all right, tell him I'm not here. Tell him I'm, I'm busy dressing up as a giant vampire woman. He'll have to believe that. Why wouldn't he? Many things stand out about Einstein and his intellect, of course, but one of the most amazing things about him to me was his almost uncanny ability to use simple thought experiments to come up with some of the most revolutionary ideas ever. Case in point, in 1907, the same year he was thinking about anti-telephones, he was sitting at his desk in the patent office and he had reportedly the happiest thought in his life. That happy thought was a dude like me across the street falling to his death from the roof. <laughs> Who had made that thought so happy, however, was that Einstein realized with no other reference points the falling man in freefall wouldn't be able to tell if he was under a gravitational force or not, whether he was accelerating or not. And because of this reference frame difference, Einstein started thinking of gravity not as a force itself, but as a curvature to space-time, a dimensional fabric. And indeed, this is how we understand the universe and gravity today. All of this from a thought experiment over a hundred years ago from some dude with an awesome mustache at his desk thinking about a guy like me falling to his death. It, that's incredible. Oh, I should, oh, I should tell Kyle if he, oh, does he know that story? He better not be ducking my calls. Who doesn't have their voicemail set up in 2021? What year is this? Oh, it's 2020. Now that we know some of the fundamentals here, we can get into how an anti-telephone is supposed to work. And it's going to involve drawing our simple Minkowski diagrams again. But remember this time that space-time warps to accommodate the immutable speed of light. So again, I'm going to draw our simple diagram, starting with both space and time for me and Kevin. Here's our space and time. I'm going to draw the speed of light boundary here in yellow. And here's what we're gonna do differently this time. Instead of sending a communication, some information, a phone call to Kevin some vast distance away, slower than the speed of light, what are we using? Cricket wireless? I don't know why I'm taking shots. We're gonna send that signal faster than the speed of light. And look how it crosses the light speed boundary and goes into elsewhere. So sometime later in my future, I send this red signal to Kevin faster than the speed of light. Now on the face of it, this looks all hunky-dory. Do people still say that? I'm sending a signal, it just happens to be going faster than the speed of light. Kevin still receives it some finite amount of time later. That's cool, right? Wrong. We're not considering, like Einstein would, the relativity of the situation. Now suppose that one of the many enemies I've made here with my work at the facility is trying to snoop on my communications to Kevin. They get in a spaceship with the hope of intercepting my signal to them. So again, the important thing to realize here is that when they get in the spaceship and start traveling quickly, space-time is going to warp for them. So now I'm gonna draw this spaceship's time and space as it changes here is where the anti-telephone weirdness comes in. I'm now going to draw planes of simultaneity in this warp space-time and superimpose it on my call to Kevin. Okay, now do you see the issue? In this warp space-time, from this perspective of my enemy in this ship, they actually encounter the signal in their space-time before it was sent 
in mind. To them, they encountered this message before it was sent. So if something, which we call an anti-telephone, could send messages faster than the speed of light, then from a certain point of view, those messages could arrive before anyone sent them. It's like messaging the past, literally. You could call yourself in the past and tell yourself to buy all that Dogecoin, or you could tell yourself in the past to stop talking about Dogecoin before your marriage imploded. That'd be nice. But how theoretical is a anti-telephone-like device like this. I mean, could we actually build something like this? I, oh, 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 yeah, no, hey, I can talk. No, they don't look like that. Close, though. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I should call Einstein on this thing. A lot of our favorite science fiction depends on the existence of faster-than-light communication. For example, it would be downright impossible for an efficient galactic federation to exist when ships are half a galaxy apart without FTL comms. Science fiction and science fact alike has tried to get around this problem by stipulating the existence of faster-than-light particles like tachyons that could therefore transmit information at this faster-than-light velocity. But while tachyonic anti-telephone is one of the coolest things that you could possibly say, there has never been any evidence for anything like tachyons and their existence is wholly theoretical. So we can't really make an anti-telephone today. Even if we could, the problem is still that they would violate causality itself, and the universe doesn't seem to like that kind of thing. Like you being able to phone yourself in the past to tell yourself in the future not to call yourself in the past, but then how you in the future would call you. See, it's an issue. At least with everything that we've learned today, you can see why FTL communication is such a big obstacle for science fiction to get around and how all of this started with a simple thought experiment over a hundred years ago. Einstein was a pretty smart dude. Until next time. Very funny, Arya. You think I want to talk like this all the time? It's not even fun to do. I'm not even sure what accent this is anymore. Now exiting the facility. Thank you so much to the very nerdy staff at the facility for their direct and substantial support in the creation of this here video. Today especially, I want to recognize research assistant Rodney and visiting scholar Sean Files Duggan. If you want to join the facility, if you want to drape on a silky white lab coat, if you want to get episodes early, behind the scenes photos, you want to talk to me every day in Discord, you want private members only live streams with yours truly, not like that, you can go to patreon.com slash kylehill and join the facility today. And hey, if you support the facility just enough, get your name on RA here each and every week. And as you can see, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of you. So I have no idea, just a second, I'm gonna make a phone call real quick. Hey, can you talk? <laughs> yeah, I bet you're but you're talking to some real dweebazoid looking nerdos, huh? <laughs> okay, love you, bye. Oh, this is an anti-telephone. I know what I said, but if you go back in the episode and you, the order is, it's always the future calling the pet. I got it right. Go ahead, check. Thanks for watching. Yeah, no, I'm still here. Yeah, that was pretty sick.